So I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, who is James Spudich, and who is by anyone's definition a leader in the field of biological motors. And myosin, as many of you will know, is important as the motor that, that drives contraction of muscle. Uh, unfortunately, it's causing a spasm in my back right now, but I don't hold you responsible. Um, but it also governs the movement of, uh, in all sorts of cells, probably in every cell in our body and, and indeed in most cells. And uh, Jim has studied these proteins for over 40 years. And uh, it would be easier to walk through a forest without encountering trees than to work in the field of motors without encountering James's work. And I've, so uh, some of you may know an, an essay by Isaiah Berlin called the, the Hedgehog and the Fox. And the idea behind it is that there's some intellectuals who are like a hedgehog that burrow in on one single thing that they're extremely good at. And there are foxes who roam about and learn a vast amount about many things. And I've had a hard time deciding if Jim is a, a hedgehog or a fox. You'd think 40 years on one type of protein would be pretty good hedgehog credentials. But at the same time, he's, he's looked at every aspect of that protein from the bioenergetics of single molecular movements to the function of them in intact cells and intact organisms. So I have to compromise on a sort of foxy hedgehog, which, uh, that, is that the first time you've been called foxy? <laughs> so to the, uh, to the to the drier version of the introduction, the credentials. He is a professor in the departments of biochemistry and developmental biology at Stanford University, and he's been a major force in that institution for about a third of a century. Uh, he was, in fact, a graduate student there, I believe, many years earlier with Arthur Kornberg. And he's served as department chair, and he's also ha had a lot of service as a president of the American Society for Cell Biology, among other things. He has honors, you won't be surprised. He's received the E.B. Wilson Medal from the American Society for Cell Biology and is a member of the National Academy and the American Academy of, Cell Bi uh, of Arts and Sciences. And his influence extends beyond what actually has happened in his lab, which seems to refer to itself as the Spud Lab, uh, because his Spudniks have now colonized departments all over the world uh, to carry on the tradition. So thank you for coming. <clears throat> Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, it, this is just a wonderful symposium. I actually didn't completely realize what I was coming to, to be honest. Um, but talks have been just fantastic, and the mixture of talks are just terrific. Um, I'm going to be doing something that follows pretty close on the footsteps of my good friend um, Larry Goldstein. But in my case, he talked about the brain, which is incredibly important. But here's an even more important part of your body. <laughs> you can do with a little loss of brain. <laughs> Can't do with much loss of the heart. <clears throat> uh, and uh, this is a volume rendered magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, picture in the bottom of the screen is cut off, but that's from Sandy Nappel. Um, why aren't we getting the bottom of the screen? It probably is okay for most of the slides, but um, I noticed that he's not showing up there. Now, most of you know about congestive heart failure. That's a huge killer all around the world. And a lot of you probably also know another form of heart disease, which is very, very common. Um, which comes from familial mutations, and these are the so-called hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies. In fact, uh, these were first linked to the contractile machinery, the myosin, actin, and so on, uh, here at Harvard by Cricket and John Seidman. Cricket, I assume, is not here. Uh, I wish she were, because I'll be referring to a lot of her stuff. Um, they discovered the first mutation in a family, gee, 20 some odd years ago or longer. Since then, uh, the number of families with such mutations has increased and increased. And there are several hundred people in this room practically, which means that it's highly likely that one of you is a member of a family that has 
a hypertrophic or a dilated cardiomyopathy mutation. <clears throat> so that's how common it is. I'm by no means an expert on the heart. Uh, I'm learning quickly. Um, I, I, I do think I'm pretty much an expert about the myosin molecule because um, I've been studying that as explained in my introduction uh, for 30, 40 years. Uh, and we've used just about every tool in the book and invented new ones to try to understand how the system works. Uh, but I started to say that I'm not really an expert on the heart, but I'm learning quickly because what's happened is all of our work, which has been on model systems that I won't talk about at all today, uh, dictostelium being one of them, which was mentioned this morning, the cellular slime mold. Um, <clears throat> we've done work on Drosophila and other systems as well, yeast, uh, but we've been led to studying the human heart because uh, I think we know enough about how this motor works, we can finally start thinking about how to apply all of our knowledge to these really important clinical questions. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak uh, primarily about hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies. And as I said, um, so-called HCM, DCM, standing for hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathy, these result from mutations, single amino acid change, depending on what family you're in, uh, in one of the sarcomeric proteins in the muscle, and many, many of those mutations are in the myosin itself, um, that simply reduce the efficiency of that motor function, resulting in reduced stroke volume uh, and reduced volume of blood pumped. This is a, not a major effect because in a lot of cases, if, you're not, if you don't realize your family has a problem like this, you may not realize it until you or a sibling keels over from sudden death on the basketball court, which is where sudden death comes from. Uh, it's from these family of mutations. And it's very, very common. One in 500 people have such a mutation in one of these sarcomeric proteins. Um, the two diseases are quite different. Uh, here's a normal heart in cross-section. Hypertrophic is because the muscle uh, actually develops in a hypertrophied way, and what really kills you in the end is that you begin closing off the volume that you need to pump the blood. Um, <clears throat> and this happens slowly over time, and so you may not even know you have a problem until you're a teenager or in your 20s, uh, depending on what the mutation is. Uh, interestingly, there's there can be a neighboring mutation in the same molecule that gives rise to quite a different disease where you have a very flabby heart, uh, so-called dilated heart. And, and what's going on uh, at the molecular level that causes either of these or the difference between these diseases is just not understood at all. And the reason is, is that to understand such diseases, what we all rely on in biology and biochemistry is, is the ability to take the gene that's responsible, put it into a plasmid, stick it into some cell that we can culture in the lab, make the protein ourselves, and then purify it and study it. And nature made it very difficult for one to do that with the cardiac myosin. It's just not been expressible. So in all of these years, no one has looked at human beta cardiac myosin in any of the laboratory settings that you've been hearing about. Um, and then if, what happened about a year and a half ago is a, a close friend of mine, Leslie Leinwand, and we've been collaborating for years, found that she could make the protein in a mouse cell line in the laboratory. Uh, she sent it to me and said, does this work in your assays? And lo and behold, it did. And so for the last year and a half, what's happened basically is that my entire laboratory which is uh, all of these people, uh, Kathy, Shirley, graduate students, Ruth, Mary, Jongman, Elizabeth, Sadie, and Peying, Tori, and then postdocs, Kim, Suman, uh, Masataka, and Carol are all working on this problem. And they, they've kind of got remnants of things they were working on, but everybody has joined this. Uh, and, and it requires that amount of effort. In fact, it requires an additional effort that's just starting to be built, 
uh, where I have John Mercer and uh, postdoc Tejas Gupta and Colleen Salon at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, where I have a second lab. Uh, spend a couple months a year there. And why so many people? Well, it's a complex disease, uh, and there's a lot to do. Um, and I was told that not everyone in this audience really has a perspective of what a cell is, let alone what a protein is. Um, and so here's a couple of really simple slides to, so that everybody's on the same page. Um, by the end of a you know, long life, your heart will have beat more than, say, 3.5 billion times. Uh, each day, you pump about 2,000 gallons of blood. And um, the heart, of course, is made up of cells, and there are many millions of cells that make up the heart. <coughs> and a cell is extremely small. You've already heard about this. I mean, a, a mammalian cell, a heart cell, is, say, roughly 30 microns. And a micron is one one millionth of a meter stick. The motor, myosin, that's driving the heartbeat is much, much smaller than that. I mean, it has a dimension of the order of 10 or 20 nanometers. And a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. Okay? So uh, if we took a cell, which is tiny, tiny, and blew it up to be the size of the Earth, then the myosin molecule would be about the size of this Radcliffe complex, maybe a little bit bigger. Okay? So it gives you a perspective of what we're talking about when we're trying to study these machines. <clears throat> so here's a, um, turns out to be skeletal muscle, but cardiac muscle looks very similar. And you can see it has all these striations. And if we look at this at higher magnification, you see it has sort of white and dark and white and dark striations. And what these are are repeating units of activity in your muscle. And if you understand any one of those repeating units, then you pretty much understand how the muscle contracts. And so if we take uh, just one of these repeating units and blow it up, uh, and o grossly oversimplified, because there are many proteins there, and there are many more of these filaments in that little segment that I'm showing here. But here's a figure out of Lubert Stryer's biochemistry textbook. What you have are overlapping sets of filaments, and you've heard about the actin filaments, uh, and you've heard about myosin already. But the myosin in your muscle, both skeletal and cardiac, exists in these uh, arrays which are bipolar arrays that are made up of many, many myosin molecules hooked together. And they are pulling on these actin filaments which are attached to these things called Z-lines. And then you have these repeating where Z-lines are attached to Z-lines. And the contraction of your muscle involves um, a sliding of these filaments such that uh, this may be a relaxed muscle and then below this muscle is contracted. <clears throat> Responsible for much of this uh, understanding of the muscle is Hugh Huxley, who is here at Brandeis University, and even for his PhD thesis work at the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England, was working on muscle. And so he's around, and if you want to talk with him, he's just a really great resource uh, for all of this. Um, and, and the model he put forward in 1969 was that this sliding might happen by some kind of cross-bridge movement of these myosin heads kind of walking along the actin filaments. And you've been hearing about this sort of already. So this is, how, this, this is a model that's been in the textbooks for a long time about how um, the system might contract. What these little white dots are, by the way, uh, they're much bigger than they should be, but these are supposed to be calcium ions that are coming in and causing the muscle to contract. So in your heart, which beats like 60, 70 times a minute, every beat, calcium is coming in to cause contraction, and then it's being sucked up out of the way of the myosin and, and, and actin into, into vesicles in, in the cell, 
uh, to remove the calcium so the muscle relaxes. So you have this calcium flux going on 70 times a minute. <clears throat> now, I'm primarily trained as a biochemist, uh, having been trained early on with Arthur Kornberg, uh, and, and his strong point of view, which none of us could escape having been trained with him, is that you're not going to understand anything like this if you can't reconstitute it from purified, simple proteins. There are hundreds and hundreds of proteins in that muscle, thousands, really. So it's really hard to ferry out exactly what's causing what. So some time ago, um, we started looking at whether we could reconstitute this system. And so let me depict this bipolar thick filament as a combination. So this is the same thing, but showing individual myosin molecules hooked together. So if we pull one of these out, it would look like that. And it has some interesting structure, coiled, coiled, long tail, and a couple of what we call light chains wrapped around this neck and then a globular head domain that binds the fuel of the cell, which in this case is ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. And as I said, you know, this, this head domain is about 10 nanometers across, 10 billionths of a, of a meter. So if, if I can just depict that myosin molecule more sty stylized, as two-headed structure with a long tail. What we did long time ago, you know, really in the 80s, was reconstitute this motility with nothing more than purified myosin and purified actin uh, using a microscope slide and coating it with the myosin molecules and then fluorescently labeling an actin filament, which after all is extremely small, so you can't really see it unless you label it with something. So you label it with the fluorescent probe, and you look at it in a fluorescence microscope. And, and what you see are individual fluorescent actin filaments shown here. <clears throat> and that technology came from my friend Otosho Yanagida in Japan, who showed that you can light up such actin filaments with a fluorescent dye. And then what we did was uh, set this up, if you don't add any fuel or ATP, this is what you see. Uh, but when you add ATP, this is what you see in real time. Okay, so this is a real time movie with these actin filaments being propelled all over the surface. Um, and they're moving at a velocity that's very close to that, that you can contract your muscle at maximum uh, speed. So this is really mimicking with nothing more than the purified actin and myosin what really happens in the muscle, except it's not very highly organized. This then was taken to the single molecule level in the 90s uh, in a wonderful collaboration I had with Stephen Chu from physics department, uh, <clears throat> where we really simplified this assay by putting a little bump on, a, on the microscope slide, putting very few myosin molecules down, so occasionally there's only one at the top of the bump, and then gluing two plastic beads onto each end, one onto each end of the actin filament, and then using physics to trap uh, the bead with a laser beam. Uh, and this was a dual beam setup, and you're going to hear following my talk, or two talks later, from Steve Block, who was building a laser trap here at Harvard about the same time, quite a different trap, uh, and he's for sure uh, Mr. Laser Trap Single Molecule Person, so I know you're going to really like what he has to tell you, but I'm giving him a little introduction. <clears throat> what you can do with such single molecule um, trapping is to watch a single head undergo one cycle of its ATP burning. Okay? So it binds an ATP and it binds to the actin filament and then it uses the chemical energy from hydrolysis of that ATP to mechanically pull on this, whoops, wrong button, to mechanically pull on this actin filament some distance, and the bead will get pulled the same distance, and the bead is big so you can watch it move and you can measure the distance. It's pretty simple, actually. <clears throat> this was, 
uh, a really classic example of the merging of physics and biology in the 1990s. So this is what the experiment looks like. Here's that same uh, trap. Uh, this bead is actually bouncing around left and right by Brownian motion, and it's depicted here on this graph as up and down Brownian motion. And then what happens is the myosin molecule grabs onto the filament and it does something, it strokes. <laughs> and it pulls that actin filament um, about 10 or 15 nanometers in this particular case. And then it waits, and what it's waiting for is ATP to bind that changes the structure of the head a little bit and then it releases from the actin and the bead goes bouncing around by Brownian motion again and then it happens again and again and again. So with this kind of single molecule analysis, you can actually measure the stroke size even though it's only 10 billionths of a, of a meter. Uh, you can measure it reasonably accurately and not only that, you can use this apparatus to measure the force produced and the force produced by the single molecule is about five piconewtons, which is incredibly small. But, of course, you have billions of myosins uh, involved in doing this, and they all act as independent force generators. Okay. There are like 40 different myosins in every cell in your body doing different things, and I'm going to focus on this cardiac myosin uh, in this short talk. But let me just explain that besides this myosin-2 I've been talking about, we and others have studied uh, this myosin-5 molecule a lot, myosin-6 as well, and several other myosins as well. But these other myosins are in this category that you heard about from Larry Goldstein of being processive motors. So like myosin-5 is built to walk along an actin filament like you and I walk, one leg at a time, and one leg's always bound as this motor walks along, quite different from the muscle, where the head spends only a couple milliseconds on, on the actin, does its pull, and then lets go. <coughs> uh, and this motor also takes much larger steps. Um, you can watch this motor even without a laser trap, just with a really good fluorescence microscope, because these days they make expensive but incredibly good cameras that allow you to determine uh, the position of a fluorescent dye, like this thing called Psi-3, which is giving off light. And you can determine the position of, that, of where that dye really was to nanometer resolution, so down to the billionth of a meter resolution. So that if this motor is walking, as I'm showing here, then uh, the Psi-3 moves forward and steps along. And <clears throat> here's just what you see in a movie where we've labeled the actin filaments red, and each green dot that you see appearing is a single myosin-5 molecule with a single fluorescent dye on it, which has come out of solution, landed on the actin filament, and then moves a micron or two, which is a long, long distance. A micron is about the dimension of a bacterium. And this little motor is marching all the way across that distance before it releases. Um, and if you follow this step by step, frame by frame, you can actually see that it's taking steps as it goes along. <clears throat> Furthermore, you can label both legs so that if you label one leg with a red colored dye and the other leg with a green colored dye, then you'd be able to tell whether this motor is really walking like you and I walk arm over arm or is it walking more like a, uh, an inchworm <coughs> where you know, the green would go first and the red would pull up behind? <coughs> and if you do this experiment, you find that, in fact, it walks like you and I walk. And you can see that the two dyes are stepping over one another <coughs> and not walking like an inchworm. Furthermore, um, you can use these fluorescent dyes in a way that uh, gives you a lot more information than just their position. Because it turns out all of these dyes are so-called dipoles. And the orientation of the dipole uh, causes a different pattern of light to be emitted onto the camera. So what we're all used to thinking about is that a camera will pick up a big bright spot of light like this from a fluorescent probe. <coughs> 
and somewhere in the center must be where the die was. But you get, a, you get a picture on the camera like that if the die is oriented in this orientation. But if it's oriented in this perpendicular orientation, the, the, the spot on your camera actually looks quite different. And it looks in between these two depending on the angle of the die, which means you can not only determine the position very accurately within a nanometer, but you can tell what the orientation of the die is. And so <clears throat> using this, we can study, for example, what's happening with this myosin motor, even in the absence of actin, because we can hook it down onto a glass slide and put it in different uh, ATP conditions to see whether this lever arm is swinging and what angle it's swinging through. So th that's work uh, that's going on currently. Furthermore, <clears throat> you can do something even more fantastic or maybe equally fantastic. And, and you could watch an individual ATP molecule, which is now can much, much smaller than the myosin itself. But you can put a fluorescent dye on the fuel, the ATP, and watch it go on the leg or on the head of the myosin motor as it's stepping along so you could actually watch in real time whether uh, the ATP, at what stage the ATP is going on and off the motor as it steps. Uh, but that requires the development of yet another tool, which is called a linear mode, uh, zero mode waveguide. Uh, uh, and that's something else that I'm not going to show you any data for. Suffice it to say that a lot of understanding of biology these days has required many of us to establish very new tools to study the problem. And uh, most of the tools involve a lot of physics. And so physics and biology um, is very, very common in fields of biomedicine, biosciences, and bioengineering. <clears throat> so suffice it to say that combining a lot of different techniques, um, those I've mentioned plus many more, we have a pretty good idea about how a single cycle of ATP hydrolysis occurs in, for all of these myosins and, and really a very similar cycle, a little different, but a little very similar cycle occurs for the microtubule motors, kinesin and dynein. Uh, in, in the case of the myosins, what's happening is the myosin, which has had its ATP hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate, which puts energy into the head and changes its conformation from this to that, that state now rebinds to actin, and that binding to actin is associated with release of the phosphate, one of the products of the hydrolysis, leaving the ADP bound to the head. Um, and that phosphate release is associated with a change in orientation of this lever arm swinging through an angle of about 70 degrees to give rise to what we call a post-stroke state. And then you're stuck here until the ADP comes off that allows ATP to come in and bind and release the head and you go through another cycle. And it's pretty clear now that this is the way this motor works. So can these tools be applied to elucidate the effects of HCM and DCM mutations in humans. As I mentioned already, about 50% of the weight of the cardiac muscle is beta cardiac myosin. And it's no surprise really that probably almost half of the mutations in families with this disease uh, are actually in this motor itself. And in this picture, everywhere you see a blue dot is a different family that has a residue change at that blue dot position. And you can see they're all over the map of the myosin molecule. Uh, there are some in actin, there are some in uh, the other sarcomeric proteins. And I'm not gonna get into those, although one reason my group is so large with a lab both here and Bangalore is that there are six different proteins that we're studying this in. And we needed to reconstitute the whole six component system to really understand how this works. Uh, and, and that's why it's a, it's a very large effort. But let me just focus, time is short, on, um, on the myosin itself. 
So we started about a year ago making just these 10 mutations, five hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations shown in red, and um, the blue residue changes give rise to dilated cardiomyopathies. And as you can see, they're all mixed up, and why should one cause one disease and others cause another? I'm not going to give you the answer to that today because this project is pretty new, but it's, I think it's clear that we now have the tools to ask what happens to the cardiac myosin when it has such a mutation. And so that's what's very, very exciting to me and my group, and, and that's why everybody has joined this project because I think over the next couple of years, we're going to generate a lot of understanding about how these mutations really affect the motor uh, and then give us ideas of how those effects on the motor lead to these diseases. Um, and just a couple of data examples. Here's a graph of motor activity as a function of actin concentration. And with a normal wild-type motor, uh, you increase activity as you add more and more actin. If you look at this mutation, R being converted to a C at residue 453, it doesn't change this very much. It changes other things, it turns out. But if you look at this mutation, which is at residue 403, where an arginine is changed to a glutamine, those are two different amino acids, you can see that, in fact, you activate the motor even more uh, than it normally is in the wild-type setting. So it's kind of hyperactivated. Um, the Vmax, so-called Vmax, where the plateau that this reaches goes up to about 1.9, whereas normally it's about 1.3. Um, if you look at velocity in that in vitro motility assay at that same mutation, R403Q, you can see that the velocity now is close to one microns per second, whereas in the human beta cardiac myosin wild type, it's only about 0.7. <coughs> and those are very reliable numbers. <coughs> so that's a, that's a major difference. So this motor is hyperactivated as a result of this mutation. Um, here's yet a different mutation. This happens to be a dilated, car dilated cardiomyopathy mutation. But here we're looking at it in the laser trap. Uh, and you can see that you can measure a step size. And then again, the dwell time has to do with the nucleotide dynamics. So we get a lot of information about the nucleotide dynamics out of that. Um, and finally, it's going to be great to really amass a lot of information, about 50 or 100 different mutations of these two types, so we can see what the patterns really are. But, but we, we, we're fully aware that what we're going to know is that this motor produces too much force. This mutation causes it to produce not enough force. Uh, other uh, variables that we can measure. But how is that related to what goes on in the muscle? Okay. And so simultaneously, we're beginning to develop uh, which is another reason the group is as large as it is, um, a system where we can, from patients uh, and a collaborator of mine, uh, Ewan Ashley at, at, at Stanford in cardiology, has a very large patient population. And I have another access in Bangalore to another patient population. Um, uh, and as you all probably are aware, just from reading newspapers, um, and reading uh, the dummy book of, of uh, Larry Goldstein, um, you can take a differentiated somatic cell, like a skin cell, and you can de-differentiate it under proper conditions to give you what's called um, an iPS cell. It's, it's like a stem cell, which can then be re-differentiated, depending on what chemicals you add, into a particular cell type. And people are doing this already making adult cardiomyocytes. So what we'd like to do is generate a bank of adult cardiomyocytes from a patient population, which of course is non-invasive. You just need some skin. Um, and then study not only what's happening at the single molecule level, but also what's happening at the single cell level. And so we've built apparatus, and we've already done some experiments, and have just written a first paper on using um, carbon nanotubes to grab the two ends of such a cell, and then it's, they stick to the cell quite well, and then as the cell contracts, and these cells beat just like the heart beats, 
um, you can measure the, the contractile properties of the whole cell. So we'll be able to relate not the, the, the single molecule studies with the biochemistry and biophysics of the proteins to what's going on at the cellular level, and I think that's a, a, a big jump. And then from there, of course, you have to start working, worrying about what happens to the cells when they're in a tissue uh, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> so let me just finish off with this question because you must be wondering, um, how far are we for having any hope for a therapy for patients with cardiomyopathies? Because as I said, it's a, it's a pretty prevalent disease. Um, and I think we're closer than you might think. And, and I would say that there's nothing out there. I mean, the, 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 the main therapy, if you have cardiomyopathy, is to lay low, take it easy, don't stress yourself, don't become a world-style athlete. Um, but really, what's going to turn out, and we're already getting glimpses of this in this last year, is that these mutations cause a small shift in behavior of this motor. So Larry and I both believe, from work we've been involved in that I'll mention, that you can find small molecule inhibitors and activators of such proteins that will pull you back to the more wild type activity. And if you could do that, the heart is marvelous at remodeling itself if you set things in the right, in the right um, direction. So um, Larry mentioned cytokinetics already, uh, and I also have financial interest in this company. <laughs> um, and this is not a sales pitch, but they're doing some great work on cardiac as well as skeletal and smooth muscle dealing with all these diseases. And the idea is to find small molecules that directly target, in this case, the cardiac case, the myosin molecule itself. And <clears throat> they've developed, and I'm not going to show you data, although it's published out there now. There's a wonderful article in Science written by Fatty Malik et al. from Cytokinetics that describes this cardiac myosin activator. Uh, just earlier this year, I think it was a 2011 publication. So you should try to find that. It's really a lovely story. The bottom line is they showed that small molecule activators of cardiac myosin uh, are, can be developed and that they make the motor a better force transducer. And not only that, this does, not only works in animal trials, but it's in late phase two clinical trials right now, and it activates the motor function of congestive heart failure patients to get their stroke volume back up to normal with almost no side effects. So uh, this is quite exciting, and, and this technology, I think, obviously could also be applied to hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy patients. So not much data, but I wanted to give kind of an overview of where we are, tools we've developed to get here, uh, and where we're going, and so I'm looking really forward with great excitement about what we might find out about all this in the next five years or so. Thank you very much. Sure. This, yeah. so, so this uh, wonderful uh, dandruff-like shower, which uh, triggered the muscle contraction in your movie, that was calcium, I think you described. So is there ATP that's associated with that, or what, what plays the role of the, yeah. how does so, that get into the game? Okay, so I, I didn't have time to describe this in detail, but in your heart, you have uh, internal membrane system, which pumps in and holds a tremendous amount of calcium. And those pumps are ATP-driven pumps. So in fact, an awful lot of the energy you use when you beat your heart is not so much from the myosin stroking, it's from the calcium pumping, uh, the calcium pumps in the so-called sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so yes, ATP is involved in that. It's an essential part of the process because uh, what happens is, this is a really good uh, point that allows me to emphasize something, which might make a lot of what I said even clearer. 
in your heart, not only is the calcium getting released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to induce the contraction, but it's released to its particular concentration, which is about a little more than 10 to the minus 6 molar, micromolar. And then, as fast as it's released, these pumps are pumping it back in. So at the level of the sarcomere, the calcium drops to about 10 to the minus 7th molar, an order of magnitude. And it's oscillating between 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7th, 70 times a minute. What we can see with these mutations, and we've already seen this, is that this so-called P-calcium curve is actually shifted a little bit. And so if it's shifted a little bit to the left, what happens is that when the, when the calcium goes up to 10 to the minus 6 molar, you actually get hyperactivation. And that's what resulted in that hyperactivation I talked about. Furthermore, when the calcium goes back down to 10 to the minus 7th molar, since the thing was shifted to the left, your heart doesn't relax as well. And so you end up having a diastolic problem. So if you were in a biotech company, you, you might say, well, let's just use that P-calcium curve and let's screen hundreds, hundreds of thousands of compounds for something that'll shift that curve back to normal. And I think that's a perfectly rational approach to a therapy. So thank you for your talk. Um, actually, the question I have has to do with that very picture. And in there, you have uh, quite an array of, of blue dots of mutations in both mice and in actin. And so I am wondering whether um, you think there is some sort of a common, something in common to all of those mutations, which seems sort of counterintuitive. Uh, at first glance, whether you have a rigidification, you know, loss of flexibility in the molecule itself, or you have um, alteration of affinity for actin in all of those mutations, whether you could comment on anything in, in common that they might have. Well, I think um, if you look at it from uh, 10,000 feet, I think that these mutations will fall into two categories. One category, and they, and they may fall into two categories depending whether they're HCM or DCM. I mean, it's too early for us to know. But for example, I would just hypothesize with very, very little data, that all HCM mutations are going to be hypercontractile. And they're going to, so I'm looking at 10,000 feet, not the level you're looking at. Um, so you might get hypercontractility from a lot of those mutations, and uh, on the other mutations may be inhibitory and give you low, lower level of contractility. Now, how you get hyper or lower level, if you home in at the molecular level, can be for lots of different reasons, changing the actin affinity, changing the spring constant in the molecule, changing the rate at which ADP releases, changing the rate at which phosphate releases. There's all sorts of micro changes. And my guess is that when, if we looked at every one of these, we'd find all of those things. So there's more than one way to get hyper. There's more than one way to get inhibition at the detailed molecular biophysical level. I think we'll find all the different ways of getting there, but I think there might be two broad classes. And from a therapeutic point of view, that's sort of what we need to know. Since you, since you said that the <coughs> work with cytokinetics was published, I was wondering if you'd tell us what the molecule is or molecules are, how you think they might work, and thirdly, whether all these, this information that you've obtained over the years about myosin actually has helped finding a molecule that works, or whether it was just by screening, as so often happens in <laughs> cases where people try to simulate things and uh, they just screen mm. ahead and find what's useful without listening to us at all. <laughs> well, um, the certainly was done by just screening, but the level of the assays to define hits uh, and to use what's called SAR to make the hits better and better by changing them chemically uh, relied on huge numbers of assays that derived from a detailed understanding of that cycle, which came not only from my work over the last years, but 
work in the field in general. So I think that it, it enormously helped to, to find and characterize and improve the, uh, what is now hopefully getting closer to be a drug, um, to have this knowledge base that came from what I described to you. Um, the, I, can, I don't remember the structure of the molecule. It's uh, got a really crazy name, which won't mean anything to you either, but, it, but the structure is in that science paper. It's public knowledge. Um, also, I can tell you that uh, how it works. It binds, we know that it binds. So the, the ATP fuel binds right here in the protein. This is the lever arm with these two light chains wrapped around that stroke, the 70 degrees to give you a 10 nanometer stroke. So it's whatever is happening here in the nucleotide pocket, whether you have ATP or whether the ATP has been hydrolyzed to give you ADP and phosphate, or whether the phosphate has left and you have just ADP, um, those different conditions locally change the structure of the molecule a little bit here, and that's, that change is amplified by this lever arm that swings. The cytokinetics molecule binds right here, just in between those two. And it's, if you know in more detail uh, the biophysics and, and biochemistry of the molecule, it's, it's just where you might have hoped something would bind that might tweak this, um, this conversion. What it does by binding there specifically is it causes the phosphate to get released more quickly. And it doesn't change ADP release rate. It doesn't change almost anything else about the cycle. All those things have been looked at. It changes how fast the phosphate comes out. And too long of an answer because we're way over time as to why phosphate release being quicker would result in higher force. But that's easy to understand. But I think I, I better not try to get into it. It's another five minute discussion. But I can tell you later. And it is described in the paper. So I, I would refer you to the science paper. Thank you very much. So um, our next talk will be um, Dr. Susan Dutcher, and it's my pleasure to be introducing her. Um, Dr. Dutcher obtained her PhD in genetics from the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, she, there she worked on yeast and worked on the cell cycle with Lee Hartwell, um, who subsequently went on to win the Nobel Prize. Her postdoctoral work was done at Rockefeller University in the laboratory of David Locke, where she began to work on a unicellular alga known as Chlamydomonas reinhardi, or clammy, which, is a, which she affectionately referred to as a pond scum, and she's worked on this unicellular algae throughout the rest of her career. What is really distinctive about Chlamydomonas is that in addition to being a great genetic system, it has two flagella, two um, that that will propel the cell either forward or backward in, in the pond. Um, and, so she, and she has worked extensively on understanding how these flagella or cilia work um, and also how they're assembled. After Rockefeller, she um, began as a faculty member at University of Colorado Boulder before going to her current position at Washington University in Seattle, where she's a professor of genetics. Um, what did I say? Oh, sorry. Well, I was thinking, I've got to say St. Louis. Washington University, St. Louis, W-E-U-S-T-L, um, as it said. Um, and she's a professor of genetics there. Um, she has won a number of awards, including the NSF's Faculty Award to Women Scientists and Engineers, a, a Searle Scholar Award, 
She was the director of the 2006 International Conference on Cell and Molecular Biology of Chlamydomonas. And her work is really noteworthy for using a wide combination of genetics, biochemistry, microscopy, and computational biology to really try to understand these very complex and small organelles. Susan? Thank you, Roz. I want to add my um, sincere appreciation for the organization of this meeting. It's been incredibly interesting and I think it's really bringing together people who are going to make up the future of, of how we think about doing biological and biomedical research. So as Roz mentioned, we've been interested in for a long time in trying to understand let, let me see. Um, these organelles, which are cilia or flagella, depending on, on what you want to call them, but I'll sort of use them interchangeably. And the fact that these organelles, as we go from this little green alga on the right to humans, are amazingly conserved. And many of the things that they're going to do turn out to be conserved between those organisms. And so they come in two flavors. Um, until fairly recently, the flavor that ever, most everybody knew something about were modal cilia, the ones that line your respiratory tract, your nose, the oviduct that are found on sperm. And they were ones that move either the cells themselves or move fluids over them. But more recently, in the last 10 years, the role of, of a single cilium here in the hair cells of the inner ear or here on a retinal pigmented epithelial cell in culture, just as that little line, um, have become incredibly important. And these are known by a variety of names, primarily by the name primary cilia. And these organelles, although they were sort of disregarded until recently, have become key signalers and sites of, of, of in sensing the environment and trying to understand things. So I'm going to give a little bit about those, but then come back to talking about modal cilia. These are organelles that are distinguished by the fact that they have triplets um, at the base in the basal bodies or doublet microtubules in the in cilia. They are incredibly complex molecular machines. They have over a thousand polypeptides that make up basal bodies and the cilia together. And there are going to be lots of different motors of which I'm going to tell you about just a few. They are amazingly conserved. If you look through the eukaryotic lineages, you'll find that they actually span a large range from people down to parasites with notable exception, that they are actually organelles that have been lost in flowering plants and in most of the fungi. And that actually is important in some of the computational approaches that we've begun to take. So this is Chlamydomonas, um, shown here as an EM. And just to give you a scale, it's about 10 microns. Out at its end, it has two flagella or two cilia. It has a nucleus. And it is a great big chloroplast. And it uses its cilia in large part to try to take advantage of being a photosynthetic organism. And so some of the behaviors I'm going to show you at an at a organismal level are based on the fact that this cell wants to be able to do photosynthesis. <laughs> so a few years ago, we actually, as we began to look at molecules that were involved in building cilia and the structures that template them, the basal bodies, decided to actually take a computational approach. And the idea was that we knew that Chlamydomonas built these beautiful organelles. There's a, a 9 plus 2 structure of cilia. They were basically almost identical to the structures you would see in humans. And so we simply took and asked what proteins are shared in common between Chlamydomonas, which has about 15,000 genes, and humans with a varying number, let's say 22,000 in this case, what were shared in common. And when you do that, there are about 4,000 that are actually have a significance of greater than 10 to the minus 10th. Um, but we took advantage of the fact that Arabidopsis, a flowering plant, actually lost these organelles. And therefore, we assume they actually lost the genes as well. And so we then subtracted, and we got this set then that we thought would be enriched in genes that were involved in building cilia as well as basal bodies. And there, there turned out to be about 700 genes of which about 320 of them are reciprocal best matches. And as you start to look through that set of genes, it turns out that it's highly enriched by lots of different parameters in genes that are actually needed for building cilia and flagella. Um, and as those genes became identified, it became clear that these genes had incredible numbers of effects. 
So if you have a defect actually in some of these genes that affect modal cilia, you get infertility, as you might imagine, sperm don't move. You get respiratory infections because the cilia move your mucus along to keep bacteria and viruses from settling in. More recently, it's become really clear that you get congenital heart defects because the cilia are important in making decisions about right, right, left asymmetries. And when you don't make the right decisions about right, left asymmetries, your heart tube misfolds and you get congenital heart disease. If you now look at diseases, in fact, with sensory cilia defects, it turns out there are kidney diseases of a variety of different kinds, retinal degeneration, a very common disease, the um, central obesity, probably because um, children overeat, um, diabetes, there are multiple kinds of learning disabilities, probably both autism and dyslexia, as well as other diseases, um, polydactyly through defects in the hedgehog signaling pathway, there's overgrowth of the bile duct. In fact, if you don't build any cilia, you actually have embryonic lethality and anosmia because that's a case in which you have no sense of smell because you fail to localize olfactory receptors to the cilia in your nose. And so there's a growing number of human diseases that are defects in these very complicated little organelles. Now, here's an example of one of the motors. It's now moving particles out to the end, and you can see them bringing them back. And again, this is actually motored by kinesin that you heard about from Larry earlier and brought back by a dynein molecule. And in fact, again, as in an axon, everything is made out here in the cytoplasm and has to be transported out your cilium. And so defects in building the structure as well as placing many receptors, of which there's a list here of a growing number of molecules that actually have to be moved out into the cilium by these motors um, and are found on the, on the, on the membrane of, of primary cilia are a cause of many of those diseases that I told you about. Again, a growing list of diseases with numbers of genes that actually have homologs and chlamydomonas. And therefore, you can see that this model organism becomes a great place to begin to think about how to understand a growing number of somewhat rare human diseases that actually have defects in motors and in their transport and in various proteins. I'm going to come back at the end and tell you a little bit about PCD. This is primary cilia dyskinesia, a disease of, of modal cilia. So here, just to give you an example of motility, are cilia, as you saw, I think, earlier um, that come from the airway. You can see them beating. And then you saw them actually speed up, and that's because they actually were given a molecule that was an irritant, and they actually change the activity of the dynenes and actually cause the waveform to become faster and actually the waveform to become modified. You also have cilia in the fourth ventricle of your brain, in the epidermal cells, and again, you can see there's quite a different waveform that's formed and that actually helps to mix cerebral spinal fluid. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my time telling you about some of the studies we've done to try to understand how we can regulate um, dynenes, these large ATPases that walk along microtubules, to give us waveforms. So here's a sort of blown up view of what a cross section through a cilium would look like, a modal cilium. You can see the membrane. You can see the nine doublet microtubules. They surround two central microtubules as well as all of their interesting projections. There are nine radial spokes, and there are dynein arms that come in chlamydomonas as sort of a group of three that are on the outer circumference and groups of either two or one that are on the inner circumference. And so they're called outer and inner dynein arms. And loss of those by a variety of mutations in chlamydomonas, both in, and in people, give changes in the motility to the cilia that exist. And so I'm going to spend most of my time telling you about a mutant that affects one of the inner dining arms because it has a really interesting um, regulation by the environment. So if we think about these molecules, we know that they're living here on these microtubules. They're bound at one end to one of the microtubules. And then through the action of cleaving ATP, it walks along the microtubule, causing the two microtubules to slide relative to one another. That sliding then is ultimately converted into the bending that you saw in some of those pictures. But you'll realize it's not that simple. <laughs> because if, if 
you have your dynes active on both sides of the nine double microtubules, it's not going to work. So you have to actually control it radially. You have to turn on some on one side and some on the other side at different times. And that may be the role and part of those radial spokes that I showed you. But in addition, you're going to have to control it so that you turn on things at the base at a different time than you turn things out distally. And so there have to be many different kinds of regulation that actually have to happen. And that's one of the things that we're actually trying in what I, is a great collaboration I now have with a mechanical engineer to begin to think about how we can actually model and mathematically model some of these interactions. So I'm going to tell you about the regulation of an axonemal dynein first. And the dynein I'm going to tell you about is one that's called inner dynein arm 1I1, or F. It's a rather complicated dynein. It has two dynein heavy chains, large molecules, about 550 kilodaltons in size, three intermediate chains, a large number of small molecular weight things. And so this is a complex that's several million daltons in, in, its, in its size. And if you have mutations that cause the loss of this dynein via a number of different kinds of mutations, the stells swim slowly. And as I'll show you, they have an altered waveform. But we really got interested in this because of a second phenotype that it has. And that is, as you watch these cells, here's Chlamydomonas swimming along. It's beating its flagella at about 60 hertz. It's in red light right now. And in a moment, you're going to see it's going to get a light that's going to come in in one direction. And the cells all of a sudden orient and now swim toward that light. If we keep watching, the light's going to get turned off over here and the cells will actually start swimming back the other direction. It's an incredibly fast response, and this is what actually got us interested in the I1 dynein arm. And that's because the cell has actually got an amazingly interesting way of thinking about orienting to the light. It has an eye, it has a molecule called clamiopsin that's actually used by lots of neurobiologists now, and it senses the light, and when it senses the light, it actually does a really interesting thing. So normally, the waveforms of the two flagella, the two cilia, are identical. But when it receives this light signal, one of them remains active, shown by the bent. The other one becomes less active. And as you can think about that, you have one strong ore, one weak ore. The outcome is that you turn and move toward the light. And it does this because the bead, although it's almost completely planar, has a slight aplanar three-dimensional event. And it actually causes the cells to rotate around that long axis at about two hertz. That means that the eye actually gets to scan the environment. And that it does what I say is it integrates, it does calculus. And it actually knows that if it's seeing light from this side that's the same as it sees light from this side, it keeps the two flagellar waveforms the same. But if there's more light on one side than on the other side, one of the two flagella is going to get an inactive waveform, and it's going to turn. And you saw how fast that actually happened in the movies that I showed you. And so we set out, actually, to see if we could find mutants using forward genetics that would be defective in this phototactic event. And what we found, just my little bit of biochemistry, <laughs> was that the first mutant that we had was completely missing the I1 arm. So if you're missing the I1 arm, you're unable to do phototaxis. And more interestingly, we found two mutants that we called modified in inner arm, MIA1 and MIA2, that turned out to be, have one of the proteins in this complex, IC138, to be hyperphosphorylated. And so here is in wild type, 140 and 138. Here it is in MIA1. The band is actually shifted upward. It has a slower migration in these gels. And if you treat it with a phosphatase, it drops down. You can see it more obviously here in MIA2, and it drops down. And so these were mutants that had a defect in phototaxis, and they would have had a defect because they actually hyperphosphorylated IC138. And so the model that came out of my lab, is, and in primarily from Wynn Sales Lab at Emory, was that. When you have IC138 phosphorylated, <coughs> sorry, dephosphorylated, the arm is active. And when you have it phosphorylated, it is inactive. And it's here that they act through a casein kinase and by a phosphatase, in particular, as we went on to show, 
um, it turned out to be PP2A, that if you inactivate that, you ended up getting this same kind of phenotype. And here again, you see the PF4 mutant, which is a defect in one of the subunits of protein phosphatase 2A, basically not being phototactic compared to its wild-type parent. Now, you should realize that that can't be the whole story. There's, I told you that you actually have to turn one flagellum on and one off. The, the I1 mutants turn it off everywhere. So you have to have it active to be phototactic, but there has to be more than what I've just told you. And so we um, fortuitously ended up um, beginning to think about this in um, what was, I think, an unexpected way. And so here again is just to show you that our wild-type strain is normally going to swim toward the light. It's positively phototactic. The light in this case would be over here. There was a wild-type variant, a variant that came from a potato field in Amherst, Massachusetts, that actually had a slightly different phenotype, and that is that it was negatively tactic. It actually swam away from the light. So it was still tactic, but it went the wrong direction. And here again is Mia 2 to just show you. And what happens in this strain versus the wild-type strain is that the wrong flagellum gets turned off and has an inactive waveform. So the, this is a mutant called Ag1, and it actually changes the direction of taxis. And so in a collaboration with um, Gianni Preparano's lab, and in particular a postdoc in his lab, Carlo Waimani, we actually set out looking at a set of proteins that they were interested in that are me membrane deter resistant <laughs> detergent-resistant membrane proteins, so what people have sometimes called lipid raft proteins. And so they developed a protocol in which they were able to isolate a set of four proteins from the flagellar membranes of wild-type cells. The, the PrEP contains four proteins. We went in and knocked them down, and it turned out they had just that phenotype that I showed you. They were negatively tactic. And so this is Ag2. And this is a immunofluorescence to show you that it has a really interesting localization. It's found in the flagellar membrane, but right at the base as it connects to the cell. And Ag3 is also in the same place. And knockdowns of both of those gave us that negative tactic phenotype. It was then also helped by some really um, results that came out recently from Ritsu Kamiya's lab, in which he actually showed that the direction of phototaxis could be changed by changing the redox potential of the cell. And so if you take a wild-type cell and you put it with hydrogen peroxide, it's always phototactic to the positive side. And if you quench reactive oxygen species, it's always negatively phototactic. That turned out to be really interesting in light of the fact that Ag3 is a flavodoxin, and therefore it presumably has a role in terms of reducing potential targets. And so we think that through its action, it actually signals the negative to positive switch. So if you have a wild type, you become positive. And Ag2, which I told you is right at the base, we think actually has an interesting potential role as a gatekeeper. As those things are moving into the flagellum, that there are going to be components that move from the cytoplasm through, we think, the Ag2, Ag3 complex and then get modified to decide whether you're going to be tactic or not tactic. The final thing is that we don't quite understand is how you get a difference be ah, between the two flagella. And we have actually have Ag1, that wild type variant in hand now, and we think it may be the key to give us the difference between the two flagella. So let me just give you a brief view of how we're trying to think about modeling. So I've told you from the study of, of the, this one dynein that it's regulated by phosphorylation. It may be re regulated by the redox potential and reduction of various proteins. How are we going to think about modeling the complicated waveforms that I showed you? How are we going to get from looking at something like that to being able to actually understand what's going on? So the first thing that we've basically done is taken advantage of a trick that was devised by David Luck and Charles Brokow back in the 80s, in which they took advantage of a mutant called Uni1 that builds only one flagellum. Therefore, as you can imagine, it spins in place, making it really easy for us to gather waveforms. 
And so what we do is we gather a whole set of waveforms. Um, Phil Broke, um, Bailey then wrote a program that sorts these so that we can actually take all of these and put them into an arrangement and get very refined views of what waveforms look like. So our first goal is simply to take what the waveform in wild type looks like. And that's what happens is we remove various different parts of the flagellar axony. So here, we've removed all of the I1. You can see it has a pretty profound effect on the waveform. If we have the BOT5 mutation, it removes these three light blue proteins. And you can see that it's not quite this, but it's not as bad as missing the whole complex. And the interesting thing is that looking at these things and looking at a large number of parameters, it looks like the thing that's the most different in these is that there's actually a different propagation of the, both the principal bend and the reverse bend. And that we actually think that missing one dynein may actually affect the regulation of other dynein's. And so we're actually beginning to have to think about crosstalk that's going on. Those are just the numbers for you. This next thing, and it's what's been great about working with a mechanical engineer, is what happens to stiffness? So we have this flagellum. You can think of it as a little beam. If you make it stiffer, it's going to be harder to make it bend and generate a waveform. And so we came up with ways that we could try to genetically and pharmacologically change the stiffness of the flagellum. And so here are examples of wild type again. This is a mutant that's a, a single point mutation in the colchicine binding site for beta tubulin. It changes the waveform. And this is a flagellum that's actually being treated with the pharmacological agent Taxol. And you can see it actually has a fairly profound effect on the waveform. And in fact, if we now capture the cells and look with using optical tweezers at the stiffness of the flagellum, Taxol makes the, micro, the flagellum um, significantly more flexible. And therefore, flexibility looks like it's actually playing an important role in being able to generate out those waveforms. We're also beginning to ask what happens about passive connections. So if you had a piece of paper and I pushed down, it would just drop. But a flagellum has lots of interconnections. And so if you push down on it, it actually bends up at the other end. And so we're now using a set of mutants to actually see if we can look at those connections and ask what they do to the waveforms as well. I should tell you our, oops, I took it out. <laughs> I was going to show you our first attempt at mathematically modeling what we have. It looks really bad, so I took it out so you don't get to see it. But we're hoping that as we begin to collect more data about missing different substructures and that taking into account these ideas about stiffness, and, and, and passive connections that will actually begin to be able to actually begin to model what these waveforms are doing. And I want to end by bringing it back again to human disease and tell you about our attempts to actually begin to understand um, a set of fa a family. Ah, I did put them in. There they are. They look bad. <laughs> to tell you about a family that um, has primary cilia dyskinesia. And so primary cilia dyskinesia in this family, and as in most families that have it, are people who turn out to be missing the outer dining arms. They have chronic bronchitis, which leads to um, severe lung and um, um, loss of lung function and often the requirement for transplantation of the lungs. Males are often infertile. Females are actually OK. And a growing number of patients are turning out to have congenital heart disease in which they actually have um, fairly major effects in terms of the formation of the heart. So they're missing these large complexes, the outer dining arms. And we ended up having a family that came from um, southwest Missouri. It's an Amish family. It has 400 living members. <laughs> um, it has five generations of living members. And um, one of the kids came into the pediatrics clinic in, at WashU in St. Louis um, with severe bronchiectasis and bronchitis. And as we began to look at this family, we found out that many of the individuals, all those shown in blue, um, are affected, as well as this branch that actually moved recently from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, turned out to have primary cilia dyskinesia. This part of the family actually has a defect in the outer dining arm protein, one of the common causes of primary cilia dyskinesia.
The other ones turned out not to have the same mutation as this part that just entered into the pedigree. And so we took advantage of being able to do whole exome sequencing. We sequenced the DNA from two parents and an affected child, two parents and an affected child. And we assumed that this was an autosomal recessive. And when we looked through it, it turned out there was only one gene that fit that pattern of inheritance. And it was a gene called HEDR2. HEDR2 has one paper about it, a paper that says it has a heat repeat. <laughs> so there was nothing known. The interesting thing about this gene is it's a gene that's found only in ciliated organisms. It turns out to be a gene that's actually upregulated in Chlamydomonas when we cut the flagella off, which is a good sign that it has something to do with cilia. And in the patients, it has a missense mutation in a leucine that's conserved from humans to Chlamydomonas to Giardia, and so it's changed to a proline. We knock this gene down in Chlamydomonas. And depending on the level of knockdown, we either get no flagella or we get slow flagella, which is the phenotype we often see in individuals who are missing out or dining arms. And if we knock it down in human tracheal cells, um, we find that we actually get immodal cilia as well. This is a protein that much, and these are just to show you the EMs from the patients that are knocked down. The thing that was actually surprising to us is that this protein is actually localized to the cytoplasm. It's not a ciliary protein. And therefore, it grows, I think, an increasingly large and probably complex group of proteins that turn out probably to be important for assembly factors for helping these large dining complexes begin to assemble in the cytoplasm. And David Mitchell at uh, SUNY has actually identified four genes in Chlamydomonas and patients with those mutations in which the dynenes are unable to properly fold. And we think that HEDR2 is going to be another member of what we think is an increasing number of genes that are going to be important for helping these large molecular weight complexes to assemble. So in summary, we followed our interest in how organisms undergo phototaxis and how you make two flagella behave differently. We're not quite there to understanding it. But we think we have good hints about multiple layers of regulation that will give rise to that. We're hoping that as we begin to collect more parameters that we'll actually begin to be able to model a little more realistically how you generate out a principal bend and how you recover through the recovery stroke. We think that as we begin to look at other patients who have primary cilia dyskinesia, that there's going to be a growing number of proteins that affect both axonemal dynenes in their folding, and I would predict cytoplasmic and IFT dynenes in terms of how you build these large molecular complexes and get them to fold properly. And finally, I think there's a real um, good reason to keep studying, studying model organisms, in particular what they do with cilia, because these proteins are incredibly conserved and really have a unique way that you can use genetics, biochemistry, and imaging in these model organisms that teach you something about what these proteins do in humans. So this work has been possible um, with help from a lot of funding agencies. And in particular, the project I told you today has been a real collaboration with um, people in mechanical engineering, people in pediatrics and medicine, and um, people at, at a variety of institutions. And in particular, this is a project that's actually been driven by three amazing undergraduates um, who have been really major players in what we've done. Thanks. So I have a, a question about the number of proteins found in the cilia. You said thousands, and yet when you looked at the overlap, the bio, it was about 377. And Pazur, who's isolated the uh, cilia from Glendomonas, I think finds something around 200 or so. So the, I, I just wanted to you know. I know where I got 1,000. OK. So the number I gave you for 1,000, I think, is the basal body plus the cilia. Um, I think the basal body has about 200. I think Pazur actually found about 600. 
um, that have at least three hits in his proteome mixed up. So he has 200 that he had absolutely confidence because they had 20 or 30 hits. But there are actually about 600. And many of those are things that we actually have other kinds of data for. And then we actually have large-scale RNA-seq experiments now that give us proteins that are found many places. And so we don't come out with them in our computational screen, but we think they're upregulated. So I think it's a growing number. OK, so let's say 1,000. <laughs> How much of the 1,000 then are in common with human proteins? I mean, my question really is, when you really, now that we have so much more information, how much better are we with respect to the absolute conserved number of proteins? You want the conserved number. I think the conserved number is probably about 400. And, and that's for modal cilia. If you look at primary cilia, the number is much less, because if I didn't show you, many of those little substructures that are present in modal cilia are not present in primary cilia. And so if you looked only at those, the number would be considerably smaller. So, maybe a slightly related question. In one of your first slides, you showed us how different the waveforms were in, say, a ventricular ciliary bead or a respiratory cilia. Do you know at this point whether those distinctions come from different isoforms of the protein that are, that are the core mechanism of the cilia, or is it regulatory pathways that are driving the differences? So I have no real data to tell you the answer to that. Um, mammalian cilia, unlike Chlamydomonas flagella, have been very difficult to isolate in, in any kind of purity. So in Chlamydomonas, we simply give them a pH shock, and the cilia, the flagella, fall off, and we can separate them away. In mammalian cells, that kind of approach has not worked. And so it's been much harder to get really cute, pure preps of cilia. I would guess that there's probably a little of both. So if you look at, at transcriptome kinds of information, it looks like lung cells have different dynines being expressed than those that you see coming out of the, out of the brain. And so I think there's some things about gene expression. But I would also guess that there simply are environmental differences. I mean, as you saw, the waveforms that actually happened when you just exposed them to a, slight, a chemical that was slightly noxious gave you different waveforms. And so I think they're going to be all of the above. <laughs> Not a real answer. <laughs> can, can you tell if the uh, Amish have a proclivity to these cilia-related diseases because of I, I think that much of the reason that we find them is because there's a large amount of consanguinity, a lot of inbreeding that goes on. You couldn't see from the pedigree because there's 400 people on it. There's a lot of aunt-nephew marriages that go on. The family that we actually looked at um, share a great-grandparent in common. And so part of the reason it actually worked for us, and I thought it might not work for us, is that there is a huge amount of inbreeding. And luckily, there weren't other homozygous mutations that made us have a hard time finding it. 